I gotta say, it feels good to be getting back to Jackbox. I say that from a video production standpoint, however, because this year's pack has received mixed reception on Steam, which, believe it or not, is a first for a party pack. It troubles me to see that, but it also troubles my wallet seeing this pack has a higher price point, from the typical $30 to now $35. Not to mention, at launch, this game was not discounted, so I basically paid about $10 more than I usually pay for a pack at launch. I mean, look, I'd pay double that if I had to, since I love these games. But $35 for a pack with mixed reception is a tough sell. What gives this pack its mixed reception? Well, let's dive in. TKO2. The original was always one of the most popular Jackbox drawing games. One of my favorites as well, so it shouldn't be a surprise to see it come back. For the two of you who never played Pack 3, TKO sees players drawing anything they want, and typing anything they want. Everything you've typed and drawn gets sent amongst everyone playing, and you have to slap the two together to make the funniest shirt possible. Players vote for what they like, and the creator of the highest voted shirt is deemed champion. Despite some structural critiques I mentioned once upon a time in my review of Pack 3, TKO's biggest strength was that it was really funny, often more so than Champed Up despite thinking Champed Up is the better design game. Unfortunately, I found myself playing the sequel in majorly silence with nearly every group I did a session with. There is a few culprits here, although the biggest is the new bracket system, which is funny because this is one of the most praised elements of the sequel, and it was something I was totally on board with until I took a step back and really looked at when and why players weren't laughing. I guess as a refresher, the way the original worked is that the round would start by throwing two random shirts up. Players voted for what they liked, the losing shirt got removed, and another random shirt would go up against the winning shirt. At first glance, this sounds like a bad system because a lot of comedy is built off shock value. Usually something is funniest when you're seeing it for the first time. So, due to that, wouldn't the first shirts to be shown be at a huge disadvantage? After all, they'd have to fight their way through all the other shirts to make it all the way to the end of the gauntlet. The team thought of that though via the implementation of the streak winner, which is a feature I swear everybody forgot about when praising the new bracket system in TKO2. Basically, whichever shirt won the most consecutive rounds in a row would win streak winner, regardless if they made it to the end or not. This was a great inclusion that I think really balanced things out, because the two shirts that went first had the highest likelihood of getting the streak winner, and the shirt that showed up last had the highest likelihood of getting the gauntlet winner. The biggest perk to that system is that it always kept the game funny and surprising. Each fight always had something new to laugh at, and if something could last more than a single round despite the recency bias, it was rewarded for that. Sure, it could be argued a bracket system is more fair than the original approach even with the inclusion of the streak winner, but it's at the cost of comedy, and it's not a good trade-off. Two years ago when reviewing Bracketeering from Pack 4, I said this. In most Jackbox games, if you don't think something is that funny, it's usually not a big deal since player submitted answers don't stay in the game for that long. But in Bracketeering, they do. That's just the nature of a bracket. When you look at it like that, Bracketeering is really fighting an uphill battle when its objective is to be a funny party game. Brackets are long term. In contrast, jokes typically aren't. Period. It's a sentiment I still believe holds true, and is unfortunately now just as applicable to TKO2. Once you move on to the second tier of the bracket, all of the drawings have already been seen by that point, and because everyone has already seen the jokes, nobody is really laughing as much anymore. You're kind of just silently voting for which was the best. Having the same joke come in, go away, and then come back not even a minute later kills a joke way faster than in TKO1, where a joke only stayed on the screen until voted off. Which again, I think was a much, much better system for the sake of comedy. That that being said, there are a few other blunders here apart from just not being as funny. In the sequel, the energy itself is pretty low comparatively speaking, which is mostly due to the new soundtrack. The songs are great on their own, but I feel like I'm about to fall asleep listening to some of these. Check it out for yourself. Here's the drawing music in the first game. Now here's the drawing music in the second game. There's multiple tracks actually, but they're all pretty much like that. I like it, but not for the purposes of a comedy game. The drawing tools are better than the first. There's an eraser, more t-shirt colors, and even the fill pen from Champed Up. Although, if we're comparing this to Champed Up, I still think that game had the superior UI. Champed Up had a much bigger color palette, a better one at that. And nitpick or not, the icons for the two types of pens was more clear. Just by looking, I know that's the skinny top layer pen, and that's the thicker bottom layer brush. In TKO, nearly every time I've played, I've clicked on the highlighter tool to draw the line art and vice versa because the icon for the highlighter 
highlighter looks thinner. To me, that's a skinny line art pen, and that's a thick paintbrush to fill things in, when it's actually the other way around. <laughs> that's not just me, right? I do want to give them credit for the shirt creation process afterwards. You now have the ability to not only change whether the art will be displayed on a shirt, hoodie, or tank top, but you can even change the font. It might seem like small additions, but those features alone really let you fine-tune your shirt, which is why it's strange TKO2 will delete additional slogans. In the original, once everyone submitted four slogans, you would move on to the shirt creation process, which is how it works in the sequel as well. But the difference is that in the original, all the additional slogans you entered while waiting for others to enter their slogans would still make their way to the other players, giving said people more than four slogans to choose from given additional slogans were submitted. Now, even if tons of additional slogans were sent, like enough for everyone to have a minimum of six options, anything extra will get deleted to limit everyone to four. Why? If the idea is to give you more pens, erasers, colors, fonts, shirt types, so many new ways to fine-tune your shirt, then why restrict the slogans? Because even if something seemed maybe too specific, if a specific slogan just so happened to perfectly fit a piece of art you got, the payout would be big laughs. But if everyone is only going to get four no matter what, not only is sending anything more than that completely pointless, but you're now more encouraged to only send things that can fit a number of shirts. Slogans are more vague, and consequently, will be less funny. I haven't even addressed the elephant in the room. For the new final round, you are now asked to button mash on the shirt you want to win. Straight out of bracketeering effect. I didn't entirely mind it for the sake of settling a tiebreaker in that game, but to end an entire game session on a mashing contest? That just seems like a really odd decision. On one hand, the final round pits the winner of round one against the winner of round two. So I get they maybe want to end the game on something more than just a single vote. However, this isn't much better. Between the new bracket style voting system and this button mashing thing, I'm starting to realize there's a lot more parallels of bracketeering than I initially realized. I really think they backed themselves into a corner of this new bracket voting system. The final round of the first TKO had four finalists, which felt much more substantial. Ironically, I think the call would have been to use the original voting system from TKO1 and then have the final round be the bracket system between the four finalists. As a final critique, a more in-depth timer setting than just a normal or extended blanket adjustment among all the timers really needs to be added. Because I mean like a minute and a half to draw a picture, that's a reasonable time frame. But a whole half a minute to do a single tap on the shirt I like? That's ridiculous. Especially when people don't want to vote for either submission and run the clock out. Separating voting timers from drawing timers so I can cut in half the time we have the vote without cutting the time we have the draw is a feature I've wanted for years. So honestly my bad for only mentioning it now. That aside, TKO2 is not a bad game or anything. On its own, it's actually quite solid. However, as a sequel, I think it's only expected to compare it to its previous iteration. And from that standpoint, I think this version falls short. There's still fun to be had, but I personally wouldn't play this over the original. Time Jinx. This is a trivia game, up to eight players, all centered around the era in which certain events happened. You got the main rounds where you're asked to enter the year something happened, there's the inverse where you're given the era and need to select which answer is appropriate to the date given, historical figures alongside their clone where you need to pick which one is real, landmarks that have been photoshopped out and you need to guess what's missing. One of the cooler rounds, pun not intended, is a time machine in a freezer that will ask you two multiple choice questions, and then ask you the same two questions once again but giving you hints and letting you change your vote second time around. It's all well done and in one of the game's more peculiar choices, the winner is actually the player with the lowest score. Whenever you're asked to guess a year, you get as many points as years you were off. And rounds that don't have you guessing years instead take a certain percentage off your score for correctly answering. Again, despite the seemingly restrictive premise, I gotta give the team props for the creativity on offer. That being said, as cool as the scoring system is conceptually, definitely fits the overall theming. I think it can lead to some balancing issues. If your guess is way off the mark for even a single question, it can unproportionately f*** up your score. For most trivia games, your answer is either right or it's wrong. But here you can be really wrong. So if you're completely in the dark, the best idea is to just guess in the middle of the time frame provided so that you can limit just how wrong you can be. Makes me think there should have been some sort of cap so wrong answers can't add any more than like 15 or so points per question. Since that way, players can still be rewarded for being close. After all, I do think it's a cool idea, but won't feel like they're completely out of the game after a single wrong answer. You might be thinking, hey, so why is it called Time Jinx? <laughs> Man, isn't that the million dollar question? I mean, sure, you will be presented with some text saying Jinx whenever you guess the same year as another player, but it has zero effect on the game. Players should at least be given the option to double down or something along those lines. Otherwise, why name the game after a feature that doesn't impact anything? Time Jinx is a decent little trivia game, but you gotta consider that this is Jackbox Games here. I mean, no one makes a better trivia game than this team does. So being decent is not good enough when you're standing up against titans like Trivia Murder Party, Fibbage, and of course you don't know Jack. It should also be noted that especially in comparison to games like Murder Party or Fibbage, Time Jinx doesn't offer anything to those who aren't great at trivia. For Murder Party, you got the minigames, and for Fibbage, you got the lying. Whereas Time Jinx,
hijinks is just trivia with not much else on offer. Even the presentation. With the exception of the fun character designs and the music, which is absolutely phenomenal by the way, the game is very plainly presented. Ever since Party Pack 4, they've been knocking the presentation out of the park. And while this game doesn't look bad, I don't know, I can't help but feel it looks like something you'd see in PBS Kids. The player characters aren't even animated. It's just still portraits. Again, I love these designs. But if they're just going to be stills, at least provide players more than 8 to choose from. On that note, if there's any single thing that could have made this game stand out amongst its peers, it would have been a higher player count. I understand with certain Jackbox games, it does make sense to cap it at 8, because any more, and you'd only be elongating the game. Murder Party, for example. If you had like 20 players, it would take so much longer to get to the final round because you'd have that many more people that would need to die first. However, here in Time Jinx, everyone is always answering simultaneously, and there's no way to interact with other players. Adding more players would not elongate the game whatsoever beyond, I guess, having a higher likelihood that there could be a player that takes longer to answer the questions. But I mean, you could be playing a two-player game where someone is constantly running out the timer. It's not a problem exclusive to higher player counts. Plus, like I said, these avatars are not animated, so designing eight or so more stills to accommodate eight or so more players without the concern of animating them all would not be a huge task. I want to reiterate that as far as trivia games are concerned, this is a solid one. I'd argue this team deadass sets the bar at what a good trivia game is. But Time Jinx struggles to stand out in a series known for having some of the best trivia games out there. Fixie Text. You and up to seven of your friends are asked to respond to a bunch of texts on behalf of the host. The round starts off by showing you what you're responding to, which players usually ignore or forget, and then are given a base response to work off of. Everyone is told to start typing, and then it's just you and your friends adding to that base message with the catch being that you can't delete anything you've typed. After everyone is done typing, you all vote for what words you like, with points being awarded to the players who submitted the words most voted for. This goes on for three rounds with absolutely zero changes or gimmicks to shake things up as the game progresses, and the player with the highest score at the end is the winner. That is the entirety of Fixie Text. The only other thing to mention is that at the start of the game, players vote for what types of text they will be responding to between flirty, serious business, friends and family, and unknown number. These are your four categories every session, and they never change. Sounds bad, and yeah, only four categories in the entire game is pretty rough. But it's not like it matters much anyway, since both the receive text and the base text have been ignored in every session of Fixie Text I played. And I've played the game with five entirely different groups. The bigger problem is just that this is hardly a game. A day after Pack 10 dropped, I left a written review stating that the game is the equivalent of you and all your friends jumping into a public Google Doc and hammering away on your keyboard. Ever since then, I've seen a lot of people describe the game in the same way. And I don't know if it was because of my review, or if it was an independent thought multiple people had. Although, if it was the latter, then that's brutal so many people independently perceive the game the same way I did, because the comparison does Fixie Text no favors. The thing that hurts this game most is its lack of structure. Quiplash, Job Job, Survive the Internet, Rumoring, Hell, even Joke Boat introduce something to shake up the gameplay. These changes not only keep things interesting, but they also give their respective titles some sense of progression no matter how small. But when the only progression in Fixie Text is the initial text everyone flat out ignores, all you're left with is unintelligible word salad. The more apologetic denotation of the game would be that it's chaotic. And you know what? If by chaos you mean unintelligible gibberish that is the equivalent to a toddler blurting out memes and references, then yeah, it is chaotic. Although in this context, chaos just seems like a kinder version of the word I would use. Loud. But hey, some people might like loud, and seemingly some do. And that's fine, really. It's not like it's impossible to have a good time with Fixie Text. That being said, I also don't think it's impossible to have a good time if you and all your friends were the type of bunch of bullshit in the same public Google document. Plus, if you and all your friends jumping into the same public Google Docs and hammering away nonsense sounds fun to you, you could just save yourself 35 bucks and go do that instead. If I were to review Google Docs on its merit of being a good game, I'd give it a 1. Fortunately, how good of a game Google Docs is, isn't a concern, because that's not the intended application. But when we're talking about one of five entries in a selection of party games, then yeah, how good of a game Fixie Text is, is the whole point of this review. So on that merit, sorry, but I don't believe Fixie Text is a good one. A game should not receive undeserved credit because your friends can type something that can make you laugh, because your friends can do that on anything. If I hand an artist a blank piece of paper and they draw a masterpiece, what am I gonna praise? The piece of paper? Man, what a good piece of paper that was. Probably the best piece of paper in the entire pack. It might be tempting to compare Fixie Text to Job Job, which is another Jackbox game you could argue is built around gibberish. Although the difference is that with Job Job, despite the broken English, it is still a comprehensive experience. There's a thought process there you can follow and understand, which makes the broken English even funnier. Instead of being a game that just stops at a pile of word salad, it's a game built around turning everyone else's word salad into a coherent response that is applicable to the prompt. The best submissions aren't irrelevant gibberish, but instead the ones that fit the prompt despite the limitations. It's the difference between turning gibberish into a cohesive and structured game versus just leaving gibberish as gibberish. Also, without the progression of 
of something like Job Job, you're left with a runtime you feel with three or four players, which is what my recommended group size would be. It's not too bad because you're always in the game. Once you have five or more players though, you're split into two groups and the runtime is doubled from 10 minutes to 20 minutes, which comparatively speaking, isn't even that long for a Jackbox game. But having two groups means you're staring at six wells of word salad opposed to three, and half of those you're just sitting there waiting for your turn. It should also be noted that in groups of five or seven players, the teams won't be even. If you're doing a five player game and are on the side of three, not only does that mean you're competing against two people instead of only having to compete against one if you were on the other team, but it also means there are only two players that can potentially vote for your words, whereas those two players will have three people to vote for their words. This would be fine if it shuffled the teams between rounds, but it does no such thing. If you're on the bigger team, not only will you be on the bigger team until the end of the game, but you'll also be competing against the same exact people until the end. Is this game just a complete abject failure then? Not entirely. If Fixie Text excels at anything, it's the presentation. Simplistic or not, this is a really nice looking game. I like the abstract art direction and character designs. I like the small design touches like how you can click on your character's face to randomize a new one, the vibrant flat colors, the transitions. Overall, I just think this game is presented really well. Unfortunately, that is not enough to redeem the game loop itself. Without any semblance of structure or progression, it's less of a game and more so a public Google Doc with a tacked on scoring system. Dodo Remy. One thing I really unironically love about the Jackbox team is their willingness to take risk. For a lot of games, I can generally predict how I'm going to feel about it before it even releases. But with Jackbox, I reserve my thoughts until I get to play it myself. I mean, they announced one of the five games this year is going to be a music game, which already sounds way out of the team's typical ballpark. Then you got people comparing it to Zeeple Dome for various reasons. I didn't know what to think of Dodo Remy. Well, I'm happy to say that Dodo Remy is a risk that definitely paid off. It's a new favorite of mine that was only made possible because they did not play it safe. Dodo Remy, one of now two Jackbox games of a nine player cap, is a rhythm game very much in line of something like Rock Band that sees you and your friends as songbirds performing music as a group for a giant carnivorous plant. Perform well and you're graded with a bronze, silver, or gold. Perform poorly and... The songbird angle is pretty ingenious as it was used as an excuse to add any instrument imaginable. Even stupid sh like gargling. It also lends itself well to treating the whole thing like a nature show, which they took full advantage of via an inquisitive narrator with a gentle voice. Now that the song is selected, the birds will choose an instrument. You all start by picking one of 40 songs, which is not only more than it originally had at launch. Yeah, they actually added more content and updates surprisingly, but 40 songs is more than some standalone music games I know of. Then everyone picks an instrument. The selection is not only big, I mean you get like 10 or more different instrument choices, but it's a different selection of instruments for every song. The instruments are categorized by what part of the song they are. Percussion, melody, harmony, stuff like that. The part an instrument plays determines what notes you'll play, the number of lanes you'll have, and the difficulty of your part. Needless to say, this lets each person of your group play at a different skill level, despite all working together on the same song. Certain instruments also have a gimmick to them. Most of them play out in your expected, hit the button when the note lines up style, you've definitely seen in games like DDR or the aforementioned Rock Band. But then you got these slider instruments where you have to tap and drag to warp your pitch up or down. You usually see it in brass instruments or acapella voicing, which never fails to crack me up. One of the most genius inclusions is the tap 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 syncing method. If you're playing over Discord or a live stream, it's expected there will be different degrees of latency. Obviously that wouldn't bode well if a game all about being in sync of the music. So to adjust for this, everyone is asked to tap their screen three times in sync with the host before the song starts. Three, two, one, tap. Thanks to this addition, you can rest assured that even if there's a 5 second discrepancy between you and the stream, you'll still be playing in tune with the music as you hear it. Absolutely genius. At the end, it will sync everyone's performance up so you can hear how it should have sounded all together. If you're playing in person, however, you can basically skip this since unless somebody f***ed up their sync, you're going to be hearing everyone's instruments directly from their phone in sync with the song. On that note, I do wish there was a setting when starting a session to basically tell the game, hey, we're all playing in the same room, to ignore the sync when not necessary. But having to sync up when you're all playing in a room together is better than not being able to play online at all. Mainly the gameplay happens on your device. If you've ever played a rhythm game in the history of ever, the format should be pretty familiar to you. Normally I play on my computer, but this is one game I prefer playing on my phone because being able to tap the notes with my thumbs just feels more natural. It's all preference of course. Some of my friends prefer using the keyboard, which the game does let you do. Whether you succeed or fail a song, you're given the option to keep playing or end the session. Which means unlike most other Jackbox games, there's no defined ending. You can play one song and call good, or keep the session going and play for hours. 
hours. Having a more freeform runtime makes for a more laid-back experience, and Dodo Re Mi really benefits from that. This is also, I believe, not only the only Jackbox game where anyone can join mid-game, but also anyone can drop out whenever, and a completely different person can take their place. Also, the music is like, really, really good. When I saw the game had songs like Pop Goes the Weasel and Row 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 Your Boat, I was getting some alarming Donkey Konga flashbacks since that game likewise had sh like this. But although in Donkey Konga, Bingo sounded like this, in Dodo Re Mi, it sounds like this. They put cool spins on all the public domain songs that turn your expected embarrassing kitty tunes into some genuinely salt stuff. I mean, they turned the flight of the bumblebee into dubstep. I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention the absolutely phenomenal self-titled main theme. Nature can be beautiful, but it's always cruel. So, so good. As much as the music surprised me, I guess maybe it shouldn't have. Great sound design has been one of the most consistent things throughout the entire Party Pack series. When you look at it like that, Dodo Re Mi being a hit was maybe a safer bet than many of us expected. I think they did a great job here. Whether you like it, I think it's just gonna boil down to if this is your kind of thing. I've definitely heard the critique that Dodo Re Mi falls flat as a party game since there really isn't any direct interaction between the players like a lot of other Jackbox games. While I think it's up for debate whether or not that makes it a good Jackbox game, I reject the idea that Aspect means Dodo Re Mi isn't a good party game. Although I do also like to see it. I don't think direct interaction is mandatory for something to be considered a good party game. Because at that rate, I feel you could say the same exact thing about Guitar Hero or Rock Band. In those games, just like Dodo Re Mi, everyone has their own instrument and notes they need to hit. And you don't directly interact with each other through gameplay. At the same time though, I think you'd be hard pressed to find many people who would tell you Rock Band isn't a good party game. Because that just simply isn't true. On the contrary, just about every other list of best party games, especially during Rock Band's Prime, will have it listed among the other heavy hitters like Smash or Mario Kart. When you're all playing in the same room, you hear everyone's instruments from their phone. It creates for a chill social vibe where you're all just hanging out, collaboratively creating music. No lie, me and my friends were all sitting in a dark room jamming out together of Dodo Re Mi for three hours straight until we called it. So that's gotta count for something. My only real critique isn't even necessarily the game's fault, but if you're playing on an older device, then notes can't really lag or jump around, and that can create problems. I got a newer phone, but when I was playing off of it and capturing footage, it started to get pretty choppy. But again, that's not really a fault of the game itself. I really like this one. Despite a conceived perception I often see as to what exactly a Jackbox game is, I try my best to not limit my own conception as to keep my mind open to new ideas. And games like Dodo Re Mi is why I believe consumers, nor the team itself, should conform to any sort of assumption of what a Jackbox game should be. As high of a price tag as $35 may seem, if all five games were as good as Dodo Re Mi, I would recommend Pac-10 to just about everyone. I loved it! Last in, uh, um... Hypnotorious. This one is a bit complicated, so bear with me here. This is a social deduction roleplay game supporting four to eight players. You're all given a role that is part of one of three groups. For example, there was a game I did where I was a cocktail shrimp, a part of the broader category of food. Although the catch is that despite knowing your role, you won't know any of the groups, not even your own. So through the answers of the other players, you gotta piece it all together and ultimately figure out who was assigned the same group as you. In the example from earlier, the other people in my food grouping had chocolate rabbit and animal crackers. So to score points, the three of us needed to make sure Sure we were all grouped together by the end. How would you figure it out? Well, you ask questions like, on a dating show, how would you describe your most romantic evening? You have to answer that question in character of whatever your role is. Based on what people say is how you're going to figure out who is who. The idea is to talk it out and click on whichever jar has answers that sound like they could be in the same group as yours. But if your goal is to figure out who you're grouped with to score points, then why wouldn't you just make it as obvious as possible so that way you and your other groupies can find each other? Well, there's a catch. Said catch being that one of you will be an outlier. Aside 
assigned to a group all to themselves. So we got the categories Christmas and Child's Birthday, two groupings that are very much oriented around gift giving. The Outliers category might be something like 4th of July. What makes things even more complicated is that the Outlier won't know they're the Outlier, making the strategy all about figuring out if you're the Outlier as soon as possible so you can then try to disguise yourself as another group. Since at the end of the round, everyone guesses for who they think the Outlier was. And if that Outlier was you, you get points if people can't figure that out. Of course, as usual, the player of the highest score by the end is a winner. If there's any game in Pac-10 I desperately want to like, but unfortunately do not, it's Hypnotorious. Because this is a really interesting concept for a game that, if done properly, could easily be one of the best in this series. I mean, a social deduction game where you have to find out if you're the outlier? That's seriously such an interesting concept I don't think I've seen done before. So, what's wrong with the game? A lot, regrettably. Firstly, so many of these categories are so vague, it's nearly impossible to figure out who is grouped with you, even if you had twice as many prompts to figure it out. There was a game where the categories were L and M, as in, the name of your role starts with the letter L or the letter M. What the hell kind of sick joke is that? Again, keep in mind, all you know is the name of your role. So if you saw these three answers from a player, you'd at most probably be able to deduce their role with something that kills animals, most likely rodents, perhaps a weapon of some kind. Again, you're doing a lot of guesswork, especially when there's seven other players you're trying to keep track of. So figuring out exactly what someone is, let alone the exact naming of what the game is calling it, so you can then know the first letter, and then do all of that for all the other players, all the while somehow deducing that the groupings are by the first letter in the first place. Like, what the f*** is this? The idea, the fun, and the strategy should come from trying to figure out what your category is as soon as possible so you can blend in with the other categories in the event that you're the outlier. That is the single element that makes this game stand out amongst its peers. But when the categories are this vague, you can forget about outliers altogether. The challenge then comes from trying to figure out what the game even considers a category. Especially when you don't know the overarching theme, let alone your group, you're not going to be analyzing this on that level. Even then, some of these roles are just way too obscure, and you can only ask for a different role once per game. For one game, I got Dr. Beverly Crusher from Star Trek The Next Generation. I know next to nothing about Star Trek, so I decided it was worth a reroll, and then I get Dr. Doogie Hauser. <laughs> Excuse me? Apparently, it's a character from a 1989 drama of the same name with a 60% on Rotten Tomatoes. That's just a flat-out terrible role, because even if you or another player actually knows this character, what are the odds of every single person in your group playing knowing this character? Yeah, sure, it will give you a brief idea of who you are at the start, but that's only for you to see. And you better remember what it said, because if you don't know your role, you cannot read your own description later once you click off the screen. My only guess as to why they only allow one reroll per game is because doing a reroll and seeing another prompt can give you a better idea of what the current round's groups are. But the solution to that would be to just have more obvious roles that everyone and anyone is going to know. Not sh like Doogie Hauser from the 1989 drama series. Just because it apparently started a young Neil Patrick Harris doesn't mean people are going to know this role. Not a single person in my group had even heard of this show. You might argue, hey, the other players shouldn't know exactly who you are anyway. Figuring it out is part of the game, which fair enough, but at the end of the game when it flat out presents what role you had, and people still don't know who you are, there's a problem. But the point is, roles this obscure with only a single reroll per game, on top of the vague groupings I described earlier, makes for games where you have no idea what's going on more of the norm than the exception. There's also not enough incentive to be the slightest bit clear about your role. I'm honestly convinced the best strategy is after the first prompt. Ignore your role and just try to fit in with what you see regardless if you found out if you're the outlier yet. Because you know what you are and you can force your way into any jar you want, meaning that you don't actually benefit from people knowing you belong in their group. But you do benefit from people thinking you belong in their group in the event that you're the outlier. As long as you're keeping tabs on what everyone else is answering, what you're answering doesn't really matter for your bottom line. This whole jar system in general I think just holds the game back. Since everyone chooses their own jar, there's no way to guarantee the players in your group will stay grouped with you. You shouldn't be punished when you figured it out just because someone refuses to get in the same jar as you. The way to fix this while keeping the core concept intact is on the TV. Show all the players and what they said. And on your device, that's where you can tap the players you think you're grouped with. And from there, you could be awarded points whenever you correctly click on the players in your group and also receive points when said players in your group click on you, giving you a reason to actually stick to your role and try to help each other out so you can find your other groupies, while also having a reason to stay vague to not give too much 
switch away to the outlier. The last biggest issue is pacing. This game is only two rounds and is still about a 25 minute game, sometimes more. A lot of things could be sped up or condensed. The most egregious example would be at the end of the round where it shows all three groups of the players in said groups, only to continue to another scene where it shows each player one by one alongside their group in specific role. I feel it couldn't have been too difficult to simply combine the two scenes, still having the grouping thing while just showing the specific roles over the character. There's obviously Jackbox games I don't particularly like, but this is the first time a game just straight up felt unfinished. I mean, yeah, sure, I don't like fixie text, but that still felt like a finished product. The game was everything it was designed to be. It just so happens that the thing it was designed to be was limited from conception. Hypnotorious, on the other hand, it's poorly explained, the categories and roles don't feel thought out, the game doesn't show you the final scores for whatever reason. It's sad, too, because again, I really like the concept. It's a game I want to like, but I just can't. Not at its current state. Surprisingly enough, this game was updated alongside the pack as a whole, but the most notable change Hypnotorious saw was a button that lets you clap when the roles are being revealed. Kind of a fun feature, but also like, what? I hope this concept is revisited someday in the future, but as it currently is, I likely won't be coming back to this one anytime soon. And that concludes every game in pack 10. I love Jackbox, and to be completely honest, Jackbox Games is like the one studio I don't want to see struggle, but this is a rough year for them. TKO2 is a lateral step at best, Time Jinx is an all right trivia game, but it doesn't even begin to compare to Fibbage or Trivia Murder Party. Fixie Text is barely a game, and Hypnotorious is a fantastic concept that isn't taken full advantage of. The only game in this year's pack I'm going to be revisiting is Dodo Remy. That game is so good that if it was a $15 standalone, I'd say just pick that up instead. $35 for the whole pack, on the other hand? That's steep. I could understand a price hike in a pack they thought was one of their best, but this is probably their first dud in years. Which leads me to something I want to talk about, although I should probably give this a score first. I'm giving the Jackbox Party Pack 10 a 2.9 out of 5. Here and there, you got people saying this shouldn't be an annual series. And now with the mixed reception of 10, so many people are jumping on the STOP THE YEARLY RELEASES bandwagon. I don't know what it is about these posts, but they unironically frustrate me. So take a seat, we're talking about this. For starters, I think it's a completely unfair assessment to make. If this was a franchise that was declining with every year, I could understand the argument, but on the contrary, these packs have only gotten better with time. There's always gonna be a pack or two you or I don't care for, but in general, if you were to ask people who own all 10 packs whether they prefer one through five or six through ten. I guarantee you they will say six through ten. That's how I feel, and I know other Jackbox reviewers such as Tula Thumbs feel the same. Hell, even looking at last year's pack, pack nine was a good pack. So again, I think it's completely unfair to ignore their recent successes the second they released their first ever pack with mixed reception, and then go, it's all over. They need to stop with the annual stuff and spend a couple more years per pack. I don't want to villainize these people. I'm sure most of them, just like me, want these games to be the best they could be. But being annual, I think is one of the biggest strengths of the series. Every year, when I look at a barren release schedule full of nothing, I know I always have Jackbox to look forward to. And I do. I get so excited when they tease one of the five games I know I'll be able to play this year. When I visit my family for the holidays, they always want to see the new Jackbox. It's exciting to check out Jackbox every year and see what's new. And in the rare scenario where a pack like this was a dud, big whoop, there's always next year. What I honestly think is happening is people generally equate an annual series to rushed out mediocrity. Because a especially this day and age, the reason most games do blow the big one is because they are rushed out the door. Because of that, it seems natural for people to have that perspective. Proof of that is even when Jackbox was at their peak, dropping nothing but bangers, you still had people flipping out saying they needed to spend longer making the games. But there's a lot more factors of something being good than just time. For years, the adult animated show South Park was making all their episodes in a week. Does that mean it sucked? No, far from it in fact. South Park is one of the highest acclaimed shows of its genre, and their highest rated episodes were all ones made within that time frame, but it suffered in terms of animation, right? I mean, sure, you can take that standpoint, but that only leads me to my next point. What makes a Jackbox game good, and what will giving it an additional year or two ultimately change? Fixie Text, for instance. That game isn't very good, but its issues are on a fundamental level. Giving it an extra year of development wouldn't suddenly turn Fixie Text into a masterpiece. If someone like me thinks Fixie Text, at its core, is mindless word salad, how is an extra year going to fix that unless you're flat out scrapping everything and doing something else entirely. And in that case, is that really the best outcome? What about people who like Fixie Text? Conversely, look at Push the Button. To my understanding, the game with the longest development cycle was Push the Button. It's a game they were fine-tuning for over two years. And in terms of presentation, I'd argue you can tell. It's one of the most polished, nicest looking Jackbox games. But here's the deal. Not everyone likes Push the Button. In fact, I know a lot of people who don't care for Push the Button. I know more people who like something like Quiplash, games 
startup and made in under a year, than people I know who like Push, the Jackbox game with the longest development cycle in their entire history of the series. Much like South Park, I don't think people mind the simple presentation, nor the simple nature of some of these games. More time to work on any particular game might mean more games can look as good as Push a Button, but looking like a Flash game didn't stop people from loving Madverse City, it didn't stop people from loving Champed Up, it didn't stop people from loving Job Job. I mean, honestly. You give them an extra two years to work on Quiplash? What is really being done in those two years? More prompts? I haven't even made my way through a tenth of the prompts in the base game. These aren't huge adventure games like Zelda where having more time means more content to further enrich the game. A huge appeal of Jackbox games is that they're simple. Add too much and shit will only start to feel bloated. People seem to believe that if Jackbox games had an extra year or so to develop a pack, then all five games would be games that they would love. And I can guarantee you that would not be the case. You don't know Jack is probably the most polished game in pack five. There's tons of content and there's really not that much objectively wrong with the game. But you know what? I don't really like it that much. That doesn't make it a bad game, but it's not really my thing. And even three or four more years to work on it wouldn't make me suddenly like the core gameplay loop. But then what if they spent three years on a pack and then all the games were like that? Really polished content filled games I just didn't care for. Then what? Wait another three years? For most Jackbox games, it's going to boil down to, is this your thing or not? Whole Mine is one of my all time favorite Jackbox games. Top five in fact. I'm well aware that is a very unpopular opinion. But for me, the only thing I would change about Pull Mine, if I could, is the ability to vote for the next round category. But for those of you who don't like Pull Mine, would changing that one thing suddenly make you like Pull Mine? Probably not. On the contrary, if Jackbox Games took the additional time to make changes to comply with the people who don't like Pull Mine, changing it into something those people believe would make the game something they do like, someone like me who considers it a favorite, might not like it at all anymore. Their only game in the entire history of games I think would have completely been redeemed with more time is Hip Notorious. But that is one game out of over 50 games they've made at this point. In the current format Jackbox exists, the biggest benefit time would give would be giving the team more time to think of the ideas themselves. But from what I understand, they have so many ideas at the studio, they have to decide which of the ideas are even going to make it into this year's pack, often holding back ideas, saving them for future packs. So at that rate, I say f*** it. Put out those ideas. Us biggest Jackbox fans that buy each and every pack see the games as a yearly tradition, and we want to see what the team thought up this year. Again, if each subsequent entry was gradually getting worse and worse, then I could maybe see the argument that these shouldn't be annual, but that 100% has not been the case. All I gotta say is wait for 2024's game. If their next game is also a dud, I think it'll be fair to then roll out the this series shouldn't be annual remarks, but something tells me their next game is going to be a big one, and 10 was treated more as a stopgap to keep the fans occupied, despite how we feel the 10th should have been handled. Honestly, at that rate, I think the fact they charge $35 for this pack is more insulting than the games in pack 10 themselves. But hey, I've now reviewed all 10 Jackbox games, and I'm finally ready to make something I planned over three years ago. I hope you join me again soon for a video on the full ranking of every Jackbox title. Until then, happy holidays, and I'll see you all next year. Holy cow, this took such a long time. By the time I'm doing this outro, it's not even 2023 anymore. But seriously, thank you so much for sticking with me for this entire series. I'd like to give a special thanks to patrons such as Alizard, Niji, Evan Halbert, Some Crazy Idiot, Ian, David Marchese, Gameplayer1500, Kenzo TN, Drew Kellenberger, David Pacheco, Victoria Mars, Amanda Guth, and Ronnie Batter. Until next time, have a good one.